study the history of the ancient Near East, several wars that had extremely brutal consequences, at least by modern standards, often stand out. Forced removal of entire populations, sieges that decimated entire cities, and wanton destruction of property were all tactics used by the various peoples of the ancient Near East against each other, but the Assyrians were the first people to make war a science. When the Assyrians are mentioned, images of war and brutality are among the first that come to mind, despite the fact that their culture prospered for nearly 2,000 years. The Assyrians, like their other neighbours in Mesopotamia, were literate and developed their own dialect of the Akkadian language that they used to write tens of thousands of documents in the cuneiform script. Furthermore, the Assyrians prospered for so long that their culture is often broken down by historians into the Old, Middle and Neo-Assyrian periods, even though the Assyrians themselves view their history as a long succession of rulers from an archaic period until the collapse of the Neo-Assyrian Empire in the 7th century BCE. In fact, the current divisions have been made by modern scholars based on linguistic changes, not on political dynasties. One of the successor states that bridged the gap between the Old Assyrian Empire and Middle Assyrian Empire was the Kingdom of Mitanni, which remains somewhat of an enigma to modern scholars, and has therefore so far failed to gain the attention of wider popular audiences. However, while it existed, Mitanni affected the course of history in the Near East just as much as any of the other major kingdoms, and there is little doubt that the kingdom was just as powerful and technologically advanced as its peers during its apex. The kingdom had a number of unique features in the region. The ethnic composition of Mitanni is relatively well known, but the background of the rulers remains a source of debate. The physical extent of the empire is also another problem historians face because the capital has never been positively identified and details of the nature of the Mitanni government remain in question. Furthermore, since few monumental structures have been uncovered, details about Mitanni religion and court life are mostly unknown. Thankfully, many of the Mitanni's contemporaries kept detailed records and thanks to Egyptian, Hittite and Assyrian historical annals, along with Hurrian and Lacadian Mitanni administrative and legal texts, the picture of this brief Bronze Age empire can be painted. The Mitanni kingdom sprung from the Hurrian people to rule over the disparate Canaanites of the northern Levant, but within a few short generations its powerful neighbours to the west and east had obliterated it and all but erased its memory from history. The Kingdom of Mitanni, the mysterious history of the short-lived Mesopotamian civilization during the Late Bronze Age, examines the history of the kingdom and what life was like there. The name Assyria is actually a modern derivation of the name of the ancient city of Ashur, which is where Assyrian culture began. The ancient city of Ashur was located approximately 100 kilometers, 62 miles south of modern Mosul, located along the banks of the Tigris River in what is today the state of Iraq. As such, Ashur was part of Greater Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent region, which allowed the city to grow in terms of both culture and population. Assyria was provided with plenty of water from the Tigris River, and it was also on the fringes of the rainfall zone, which meant that it was not totally dependent on irrigation. Location allowed the population of Assyria to grow, but its culture flourished due to its proximity to southern Mesopotamia, particularly cities such as Babylon, Ur, and Lhasa. The Assyrians encountered and adopted concepts already in use by their neighbours, including writing, which spurred the Assyrians' advancement and has since made it much easier for people to study them. The Assyrians' development of writing allows current historians to read about the empire's affairs, but it also allowed the Assyrians themselves the ability to document their own history. The Assyrians' idea of history was essentially the same as that of their Babylonian neighbours to the south, and involved ideas such as destiny that were manifested in the past and projected forward into the future. As such, the Assyrians' view of history was fundamentally different than the modern view. The modern notions of history are largely derived from the ancient Greeks, who believed that history should be written as a narrative and served to teach those who read it. 
Modern views of history are largely divorced from ideas such as divine intervention, but to the Assyrians it was the divine that made history, and as a result, they believed mortal failures were the result of not following divine law. In other words, history to the Assyrians was a theocratic history. Despite Assyrian historiography's long and apparently unchanging background from early Mesopotamian origins, the Middle Assyrian period witnessed a major change in Assyrian historiography. During the period of Tiglath-Pileser I, circa 1114-1076, the Assyrians began to write royal annals, which consisted of chronologically detailed accounts of military expeditions and royal hunts. The manner and context in which these annals were first composed is unknown, but it is possible these reports were initially meant to be letters from the kings to their gods. The annals were incredibly specific in regards to geographic locales and ethnic groups affected by military campaigns, and they also graphically depicted the brutal nature of Assyrian warfare. The location where many of these annals were located and subsequently discovered was in the library of King Ashurbanipal, 668-631 BCE. Over 5,000 cuneiform documents which detailed affairs of the state and historical annals were recovered from the ruins of Ashurbanipal's library. The discovery proved yet again that the Assyrians, far from simply being bloodthirsty warriors, placed a premium on literature and history. The Assyrian historical annals may have been the most interesting and entertaining form of Assyrian documents, but the royal king lists have helped modern scholars accurately recreate Assyrian chronology. The Assyrians, like the Babylonians to the south and the Egyptians to the west, kept records of all their kings in what are known today as king lists. King lists could be as simple as an ordered listing of all kings, nor they could include such things as the length of reign and other important facts. At this point, three Assyrian king lists are known to exist. One list ends in 935 BCE, while the other two end in 745 and 722 BCE. In its earliest phase, the city of Ashur, and therefore Assyria itself, consisted of no more than the city and its immediate environment. While people are familiar with Assyria and the Assyrians, the city's name itself is interesting and a point of scholarly debate, because it is also the name of the primary Assyrian god. It is probable that in archaic times, the locals attributed divine attributes to a rocky outcrop named Ashur above the Tigris River, which is where the city then got its name. Whether the god or the city actually came first may never be known for sure, but the city developed into a substantial state around the year 2000 BCE, and as Ashur developed and grew, it was eventually conquered by a king from southern Mesopotamia, who initiated a long series of royal connections between Ashur and Babylon that would last for centuries. The Babylonian conqueror of Ashur was named Shamsi Adad, circa 1813-1781 BCE, and although he was from Babylon and an ethnic Amorite, he was accepted by the Assyrians and placed in their list of kings. In fact, Shamsi Adad was the first Assyrian king to take the title Sharum, king, which set the precedent for all of his successors. The Assyrians recognized Shamsi Adad as their first king, but interestingly they also recognized his Babylonian origin. Shamsi Adad, the son of Ilu Kabkabi, went away to Babylonia in the time of Naram Sin. In the eponymy of Ibn Adad, Shamsi Adad came back from Babylonia. He seized Ekalati. He stayed in Ekalati for three years. In the eponymy of Atamar Ishtar, Shamsi Adad came up from Ekalati and removed Erishu, son of Naram Sin, from the throne. Inscriptions from the reign of Shamsi Adad demonstrate that although he was not from Ashur, he gave praise to the god Ashur and beautified the city. One inscription reads, Shamsi Adad, king of the universe, builder of the temple of Ashur, who devotes his energies to the land between the Tigris and Euphrates. At the command of Ashur who loves him, he whose name Anu and Enlil had named for great deeds, above the kings who had gone before, the temple of Enlil, which Erishum son of Elushuma had built, and whose structure had fallen to ruins.
The temple of Enlil, my lord, a magnificent shrine, a spacious abode, the dwelling of Enlil, my lord, which had been planned according to the plan of wise architects. In my city Ashur, I roofed that temple with cedars. In the doors I placed door leaves of cedar, covered with silver and gold. The walls of that temple laid upon silver, gold, lapis lazuli, and sandu stone, with cedar oil, choice oil, honey and butter I sprinkled the mud walls. This passage also demonstrates another precedent that Shamsi Adad was set for later Assyrian kings, the use of the epithet ruler of the universe. Shamsi Adad was the first great Assyrian king. But what made Assyria great during the old Assyrian period was its economic prowess. The Assyrians were able to develop far-flung and sophisticated trade networks in the late 3rd and early 2nd millenniums BCE that would help establish Ashur as a major urban center in the ancient Near East. A number of documents written in Akkadian cuneiform were excavated in Anatolia, modern Turkey, and have provided modern scholars with enough information to actually understand and recreate the trade routes and systems used by the Assyrians. For example, the documents show that Assyrian merchants developed trading towns in Anatolia where goods from Mesopotamia and Iran were traded for goods in Anatolia. There were two types of Assyrian trading towns. The Karum, which meant key or harbour in Akkadian, was the primary trading centre of a city, while the Wabartum was a smaller trading centre that functioned in a subordinate manner to the nearest Karum. Naturally, the city of Ashur acted as the central point in the trade routes. Tin from Iran and finished textiles from Babylon and southern Mesopotamia travelled through the city to the Karum city of Kanesh in Anatolia. This journey from Ashur to Kanesh lasted about 50 days and was impossible during winter as the passages through the Taurus mountains were blocked due to ice and snow. The Assyrian merchants carried the tin and textiles on donkeys that they all traded, including the donkeys, when they arrived in Anatolia for silver or gold that they then brought back to Ashur. One of the most interesting aspects of the Assyrian trade network was that it was carried out largely by private entrepreneurs. The Assyrian king was not directly involved, and it's unclear why the Assyrian king did not take a more dominant role in the merchant activities of his people during the old Assyrian period. Scholars have theorized that Assyrian kings might not have wanted to upset a system that worked, or that the kings were not yet powerful enough to influence such intricate networks. In the interim before the Middle Assyrian Empire inherited the remnants of the Old Assyrian Empire, however, another civilization would take power in the area. To understand the significance of Mitanni in the Bronze Age Near East, it is imperative to know about the Hurrian people and their language. The Hurrians played an important role throughout the ancient Near East and were crucial in the formation of the Mitanni Empire around 1500 BCE. For decades, the Hurrian language and people were complete riddles, and while it was apparent that the people used a cuneiform style of writing, the Hurrian language was not immediately recognized. The discovery of the cuneiform tablets at the ancient site of Amarna, Egypt, helped advance the general study of Near Eastern history and philology, but it did little to help identify the undecipherable Hurrian texts. The Amarna letters are a collection of 382 cuneiform tablets that were discovered in the Egyptian village of Amarna in 1887. All of the texts of the tablets employed the cuneiform script, with Akkadian being the dominant language, although dialects of Canaanite, West Sinitic and Hurrian were also used in a few of the tablets. Most of the texts are diplomatic in nature, consisting of either correspondence among the great powers Egypt, Hatti, Babylonia, Alashia, Cyprus, Mitanni, and later Assyria, or between one of the great powers and Canaanite Levant vassal states. Most of the Amarna tablets were written in Akkadian, which could be deciphered by the early 20th century, but there were no bilingual tablets that allowed scholars to compare Akkadian to the yet unknown Hurrian language. 
When the royal archives of the Hittite capital of Hattusa were excavated in the early 20th century, researchers were pleased to find bilingual Hittite Hurrian texts, which allowed them to finally decipher the language. To the surprise of most scholars, Hurrian was a member of the Caucasian linguistic cultural family, clearly separating it from the more common Semitic and Indo-European languages used across the region at that time. Immediately, those who studied the ancient Near East were faced with obvious questions surrounding the Hurrians' origins. Many believed that they had migrated to the Near East from the Caucasus mountain region, while others thought that they may have been native to northern Mesopotamia and the Syrian plains, or at least lived there at the dawn of civilization in the late 4th millennium BCE. The Hurrians' written materials offer little information about their origins, but as with much of Mitanni history, outside primary sources give a number of clues. And the Hurrians are probably referenced a few times in the Old Testament of the Bible as Horites or Horims. Genesis and Numbers mention that they lived in what later became the land of Edom, before the Edomites inhabited it. According to Numbers, the Horims also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them, when they had destroyed them from before them, and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto the land of his possession which the Lord gave unto them. Numbers 2.12 This passage would place the Hurrians from the region between the Dead Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba, some time before the Edomites were known to be there in the mid-second millennium BCE, but other evidence for the presence of the Hurrians in the Levant and or Syria remains scant. And it must be pointed out that the chronology of biblical events before the foundation of the Kingdom of Israel are not solid. Moreover, although the identification of the Hurrians with the Horims is accepted by many modern historians, this identification is not definite. There are other sources that place the Hurrians in the Near East in the 3rd millennium BCE, which can be considered corroborating evidence for the biblical accounts. There are no mentions of the Hurrians in any written documents before the Akkadian Empire, circa 2340 to 2198 BCE, but during and after that dynasty they were written about extensively by various Mesopotamian peoples, as well as the Hittites and the Egyptians. Generally the Mesopotamians would refer to the Hurrians as Hanigalbat, but they would later also recognize the state of Mitanni in their texts as Hanigalbat. To make things even more confusing, some Mesopotamians would refer to the Hurrians as Siberians, a generic term for all northern peoples. Occasionally that label was used in the same texts where they were called Hanigalmats. Similarly, the Egyptians would often refer to the land of the Hurrians as Narina, while sometimes referencing the state of Mitanni by name. All of these ancient references indicate that the Hurrians existed long before the state of Mitanni, but determining how long they were in the Near East, or even the extent of their geographic distribution, is a problem historians and archaeologists face. A major part of this problem is due to the fact that the Hurrians left behind few monuments, or even buildings. Despite the dearth of Hurrian monuments, scholars have identified a few pre-Mitanni Hurrian, or at least Hurrian-influenced, archaeological sites. One of the most important of these sites was Urkesh in northeast Syria. The Hurrians settled and built Urkesh in the 3rd millennium BCE, during the period of the Akkadian Empire, and excavations at the site have uncovered a wealth of Akkadian-era artifacts that have helped date the city, such as a seal of Taram Agadi, one of the daughters of King Naram Sin, circa 2213-2176 BCE, of Akkad. Located at an important junction of routes between the Levant, Anatolia and the Mesopotamia, Urkesh was a trade centre that was home to at least 20,000 people during its height. Northern Syria was also home to two other notable pre mitanni Hurrian kingdoms in the early 2nd millennium BCE, Urshu and Hashru. The archaeological evidence shows that all of these Hurrian cities and small kingdoms may have been connected through trade and possibly diplomacy, but they were never a unified state. It was not until the emergence of the Mitanni state just before 1500 BCE when most of the Hurrians were united under one kingdom. 
The reason for that unification, though, has been a source of scholarly debate. Studies of the Mitanni Kingdom are full of many unanswered questions that are likely to remain unanswered for the most part, and one intriguing question pertains to the Mitanni kings and their ethnic origins. Although it is known that the vast majority of the Mitanni population was ethnically Hurrians, it appears that the kings may have been Indo-European, more specifically Indo-Iranian or Indo-Aryan. There is ample evidence for this suggestion, beginning with the names of the kings. All of the Mitanni kings are known today by their personal Hurrian names, but they also all took Indo-Aryan throne names. For example, these are the Indo-Aryan throne names of the following kings. Tushrata was Tvesa Ratha, or having an attacking chariot. Artatana I was Ratadman, or having the abode of Rita. Artashumara was Ritashmara, or remembering Rita. And Sharshata I was Sattva, or warrior. It is also believed that the name of the Mitanni capital, Vasukani, was derived from the Indo-Aryan phrase Vasukani, meaning wealth mine. The even more intriguing is a list of the Mitanni gods in a Hittite Mitanni treaty. The Mitanni king Shatiwaza signed a peace treaty with the Hittite king the Sopiluliuma I, ruled circa 1344-1322 BCE, that essentially made Mitanni a vassal state of Hatti. Although the political details of the treaty are important and will be discussed later, the Hittite text references several Mitanni and Aryan gods. Chatiwaza was required to give an oath of fealty to Supiluriuma I on the names of several gods, which are listed as follows. The twin gods Mitra and Uruwana, Inda, the Nasitiyana gods, Elat, Samamenui, Tesug lord of Wasakani, Tesug lord of the Kamari. Elat, Samaminui, and Tesub are all Mitanni Hurrian gods, but the others are clearly Indic Aryan gods. The Sanskrit equivalent for the first war gods are Mitra, Varuna, Indra, and Nasatya. Thus, it's clear that the Mitanni kings, if not the Hurrian people, worshipped some of the most important gods of ancient India. The mentions of these gods certainly point to the Indo-European background of the Mitanni kings, but there are also other elements of Mitanni culture that indicate an Indo-European influence. Warfare played a central role to the success of any late Bronze Age Near Eastern Empire, with the Chariot Corps being an integral part of any effective army. The major kingdoms experimented with their chariot corps, and Emor subtracting the number of men from chariot teams, as well as the number of horses used to pull a chariot. The Mitanni warrior named Kikuli even wrote a manual on horsemanship and chariotry that sheds more light on the Mitanni ruler's possible Indo-European background. Although the name Kikuli is Hurrian, the terms he used throughout the text were clearly Indo-European. Likewise, the Mitanni word for chariot, Mariana, is believed to have been derived from the Sanskrit word for young man, demonstrating yet another link between the Mitanni elite and the Indo-Europeans. Given that there are so many links between the Mitanni rulers and the Aryans of India, it begs the obvious question of how this connection came to be. There are essentially four theories to explain the link between the Mitanni kings and the Aryans of India, and proponents of all four theories generally believe that the Mitanni dynasty was part of a warrior band of Indo-Europeans who conquered the land of eastern Syria and northern Mesopotamia and the Hurrian population along with it. The Mitanni Indo-Europeans probably entered the region as a horde, and then were hired as mercenaries before deciding to freelance and start their own kingdom. One theory among scholars is that the Mitanni were members of a band that broke off from the main body of Indo-Iranians that went to the Near East before then going back east to northern India. However, this theory has fallen out of favour with most. Today, the most commonly held theory for the Mitanni's Indo-European origins is also the most logical. According to this theory, a band broke off from the main body of Indo-Iranians in Iran and proceeded to the Near East and became the Mitanni, while another band went east to northern India. 
The third theory argues that the Indo-Aryans migrated from Iran to northern India as a group, but at some point after they settled in northern India, another band of Aryans migrated back to Iran and eventually the Near East, where they became the Mitanni. A final theory to explain the Mitanni origins is part of the indigenous Aryan or out of India theory, OIT. The indigenous Aryan theory holds that the Aryans did not migrate into northern India, but that they have lived there for millennia as virtual natives. Believers in the indigenous Aryan theory argue that the Aryan migrations still took place, but that these migrations came from the other direction, meaning the Aryans migrated west instead of east, and according to this theory, the Mitanni were one of the final results of the Aryans' westward migration. Although the debate over the Mitanni king's origins will probably never be solved, it is almost universally believed that the Mitanni rulers were once part of an Indo-European warrior elite who imposed themselves on the Hurrians of the Late Bronze Age. The boundaries of ancient kingdoms and empires were less distinct than those of the modern world and part of the reason for this is because the extents of ancient empires were often recorded in texts according to the people who inhabited them more than specific geographic boundaries. In other words, ancient rulers took into consideration the people they ruled over, not necessarily the land they controlled. Boundaries also tended to shift more in ancient times, with buffer zones and borders between states being less distinct than in later eras. Some of the kingdoms of the Late Bronze Age did have distinct boundaries. Egypt's boundaries were fairly well defined, as were Babylon's and Assyria's, but Mitanni's borders were perhaps the least defined of all the Near Eastern empires. Mitanni's northern border was more or less a latitudinal line that began at Lake Van and extended west into Anatolia. The northwest boundary of Mitanni was in the Taurus Mountains of Anatolia. This region was known as Kizuwatana and may have been the original Hurrian power centre. Kizuwatana maintained a nominal independence for quite some time, and by the Late Bronze Age it became a contested land between the Hittites and Mitanni. When Mitanni was stronger, Kizuwatana was in the Mitanni sphere of influence, but when it was weaker, the Hittites would exert control over it. The southern edge of Mitanni was even less distinct with it being somewhere in northern Mesopotamia around the Assyrian city of Ashur. The eastern and western edges of Mitanni are better known though, because most of the important Hurrian cities were located in those areas. The eastern part of Mitanni included Assyria north of Ashur, including the important city of Nuzi, but the western part of Mitanni was the most important and populous part of the empire. At its height, the western boundary of Mitanni stretched to the Mediterranean Sea and included such important cities and minor kingdoms as Alala, Aleppo, Emar, Taidi, and Alshi. Mitanni also laid claim to Ugarit and Kadesh at various times, which brought them into conflict with the Egyptians and Hittites. Although amorphous boundaries were nothing extraordinary for the Bronze Age Near East, Mitanni's boundaries were even less concrete, and this has led some historians to postulate that Mitanni was not an empire in the strictest definition, but more like a confederation of Hurrian states and kingdoms. The lack of a clear border combined with the seemingly autonomous nature of many of the Mitanni cities does seem to corroborate this Mitanni federation theory. Nuzi is one of the most important Mitanni cities that has been excavated and studied in the modern era. Located in what is today northern Iraq, Nuzi was actually the largest city in the Hurrian Principality of Arafa. Excavations of Nuzi have uncovered a large palace complex that encompassed about half the area of the walled city. A cache of cuneiform tablets was discovered and later translated, which have given helpful insight into Hurrian culture and some aspects of the Mitanni Empire stroke federation. Although nearly all of the names in the texts are Hurrian, proving that Nuzi was in fact a Hurrian city, nearly all of the texts were written in Akkadian. This is not surprising when one considers that Akkadian was the lingua franca of the late Bronze Age Near East and regularly used in domestic administrative documents as well as for diplomatic letters. 
At its height of influence, the palace of Nuzi was the home of a prince who served King Shaushata of Mitanni, ruled circa late 1400s BCE. Like Nuzi, the western city of Alala was also ruled by a local Hurrian dynasty, but subject to Mitanni control. As will be discussed more or later, Alala and some of the other notable western Mitanni stroke Hurrian cities bore the brunt of Egyptian and Hittite attacks. Despite the constant threat of being a battleground between the major Near Eastern empires though, Alala and the other western Mitanni cities were generally the wealthiest and most productive, thanks to being located close to regular trade routes, Levant timber, and the Mediterranean Sea. Excavations at Alala and Nuzi have helped researchers better understand Hurrian culture and the nature of the Mitanni Empire, but unfortunately the two most important Mitanni cities remain elusive. Wasukani and Taidi were the twin capitals of Mitanni, so one would expect that they would be quite large archaeological sites with plenty of structural ruins and other monuments. Unfortunately, though, archaeologists have yet to positively identify the location of either city. Among the ruins of several Hurrian stroke Mitanni cities, there are candidates for each, but at this time there have been no texts or archaeological remains that can provide a sure identification. Many believe that the Hurrian city at Tel Brak in northern Iraq was Taidi, due to its size and location in the relative centre of the kingdom. Some scholars also believe that Wasakani was probably located somewhere in the centre of Mitanni as well, possibly at the headwaters of the Habor River in northern Iraq. Until those sites can be positively identified, however, the only knowledge modern historians have of those cities come from references in a number of late Bronze Age texts. By the time the Mitanni state formed in the late 16th century BCE, the general extent of the kingdom had been established and a royal dynasty came to power. The historians have been able to reconstruct the order in which the Mitanni kings ruled, but unfortunately the dates and lengths of their reigns remain elusive. Unlike all of their contemporaries in the Near East, the Mitanni apparently never wrote king lists of their dynasties, or at least no Mitanni king list has been discovered thus far. If Wasukani is ever discovered, a detailed Mitanni king list may be one of the historical treasures found along with it, but for now researchers are left to reconstruct Mitanni royal chronology based on Egyptian and Hittite texts, as well as the large cache of Amarna letters that were discovered in 1887. With that said, a combination of archaeological discoveries in the Hurrian homeland and the synthesis of the available primary sources have made it possible to determine the history of the Mitanni Empire. Paratana, who ruled in the early 15th century BCE, is the first Mitanni king mentioned in extant texts, but there may have been others before him. It appears that Paratana inherited somewhat of an existing power structure from a royal predecessor or conquered a Hurrian federation that was already in place. Whichever the case, the textual and archaeological evidence indicates that Paratana was a true warrior king who extended Mitanni's influence in every direction. In the west he gained control of the important city of Aleppo and the smaller kingdom of Alala or Alalak. According to an Akkadian inscription on the statue of the Prince of Alala, Idrini, Paratana and a Hurrian warrior coalition attacked the kingdom for seven years. The text reads, However, for seven years, Paratana, the mighty king, the king of the Hurrian warriors, treated me as an enemy. In the seventh year, I sent Anuanda as messenger to King Paratana, the king of the Hurrian warriors, and told him about the services of my forefathers when my forefathers had been in their, the king's, service, and when what we had said was pleasing to the kings of the Hurrian warriors, and that they made an alliance based on a solemn oath among themselves. The mighty king heard of our former services and of the oath they had sworn to each other. They had read the wording of the oath to him, word by word, as well as the list of our services. He accepted my messenger, literally my greeting. I increased the gifts indicating my loyalty, which were heavy, and returned to him his lost household. I swore him a mighty oath as to my status as a loyal vassal. 
and so I became king in charge of Alalak. The manner in which Alala was incorporated into the kingdom of Mitanni apparently became a pattern for later conquests. The Mitanni king would lead a Hurrian warrior coalition against a principality until it finally surrendered, but instead of executing the incumbent ruler, the Mitanni king would come to an agreement with the prince, whereby he was allowed to keep his position. This situation was repeatedly played out in all the corners of Mitanni's geographical reach. Paratana was also able to take the important city of Nuzi in the east and Turka in the south, and by the end of his rule the Mitanni kingdom stretched from the Mediterranean Sea to the Zagros Mountains and from Lake Van to northern Mesopotamia. Only mountains limited the Mitanni in the north and east, but to the south and west there were formidable foes who could check Mitanni expansion. The Kassite dynasty of Babylon was in firm control of most of Mesopotamia, but while their strength prevented Mitanni from moving further south, they had their own problems with the Elamites that in turn prevented them from moving north into Mitanni territory. As a result, the initial competition that the Mitanni kingdom encountered came from the Egyptians in the west. As Paratana was expanding the boundaries of Mitanni, the kings of Egypt's 18th dynasty were likewise moving north of their borders into the Levant. Thotmose III reigned circa 1479-1425 BCE is sometimes referred to as Ancient Egypt's Caesar or Napoleon, due to all the lands he conquered. Thutmose III extended the Egyptian kingdom far into Nubian territory in the south, but most importantly he extended Egyptian influence in the Levant to the cities of Byblos, Kadesh and even Ugarit, which put the Egyptians and Mitanni on a collision course. It is believed the warrior pharaoh personally led a major military campaign into the Levant in 1482 that was accented by a seven-month siege of the city of Megiddo. After the Egyptians reduced Megiddo and its Canaanite inhabitants to vassal status, they turned their attention to Mitanni-controlled and influenced cities and kingdoms to the north and west. Approximately ten years later, Thutmose III returned to the northern Levant at the head of another large Egyptian expeditionary force, this time to face the Mitanni directly. The Egyptian force travelled by ship from Egypt to the coastal city of Byblos, where they then disembarked and marched overland into Mitanni territory, which they knew as Naharin. The Egyptians were victorious in three battles against the Mitanni in the region around Aleppo, and the historical annals from the Karnak Temple in Thebes detail how Thutmose III claimed the territory for Egypt and took several Hurrian nobles as booty. He set up a tablet east of this water. He set up another beside the tablet of his father, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Oki Perkeri, Thutmose I. Behold, his majesty went north, capturing the towns and laying waste the settlements of that foe of wretched Naharin. He pursued after them an eater of sailing. Not one looked behind him, but they fled, forsooth, like a herd of mountain goats. Yea, the horses fled. List of the booty taken among the whole army consisting of princes, three, their wives, thirty, men taken, eighty, six hundred and six slaves, male and female, with their children, those who surrendered, and their wives. He harvested their grain. His Majesty arrived at the city of Ni, going southward, when His Majesty returned, having set up his tablet in Naharin, extending the boundaries of Egypt. It should be noted that Egyptian kings employed a fair amount of hyperbole in their historical annals, so a fair amount of circumspection is required when using these texts to construct a chronology. Unfortunately, there are no known Mitanni texts that can corroborate or deny Thutmose III's somewhat bombastic statements, but there is a text in the tomb of an Egyptian noble named Menki Periseneb that does seem to confirm the Egyptian victory. The text reads, from the tomb of Menki Periseneb, four Asiatic chiefs are shown bringing tribute, giving praise to the lord of the two lands, obeisance to the good god by the chiefs of every land. They acclaim the victories of his majesty, their tribute is upon their backs being every product of God's land, 
silver, gold, lapis lazuli, malachite, every splendid costly stone, the sea, thy fear is in all the lands. Thou hast overthrown the lands of Mitanni, thou hast hacked up their cities, their chiefs are in caves. Despite the Egyptians' victories in their first encounters with the Mitanni, the latter would later use their home field advantage to take back much of the territory they lost. Given that the material culture remains of the Mitanni Empire are quite limited, historians have had problems creating a truly comprehensive image of Mitanni culture. The Hurrians no doubt played a major role in the religious aspects of the kingdom, but so too did the Indo-European elites discussed earlier, as did the Assyrians, Kassites and other Semitic peoples of Mesopotamia. Just as the Mitanni kingdom was politically a federation of smaller kingdoms and city-states, its culture was also derived from a number of different sources. The Mitanni also exhibited some truly unique characteristics, some of which were adopted by later groups, while other traits were forgotten until modern times. Among all the traits that defined pre-modern cultures, none were more important than religion. Although ancient civilizations did not follow universal religions, and therefore never promoted their theologies at sword point, their gods and goddesses were often what defined them as a people. The Mitanni kingdom presents an interesting case study in this regard, because it appears that the elites worshipped Indo-European gods along with the native Hurrian pantheon. The Shatiwaza Treaty is the only text that mentions the Mitanni king's belief in an Indo-European pantheon, so scholars are left wondering about important aspects of any associated rituals. For example, it's unknown whether the Mitanni kings revered fire like the ancient Persians and Aryans. Other points of interest, such as if the Mitanni kings practiced ritual bathing, also remain shrouded in mystery and these questions are likely to linger until one of the Mitanni capitals, and presumably its collection of Hurrian texts, is unearthed. Questions about how much or how little the Mitanni kings followed a religion similar to the ancient Persians and Aryans will continue to be debated by experts, but the overwhelming influence on the Mitanni religion came from the Hurrians. The Hurrian majority within the Mitanni kingdom worshipped the same gods as their ancestors did long before the Mitanni became a force in the region, and by the time Paratana came to the throne, the elites of Mitanni society also followed the Hurrian religion to a certain extent. The most important god in the Hurrian pantheon was the storm god Teshub, who was joined by his consort Hepat. Another important Hurrian god was the sun god Shimidi, who brought life to the fertile croplands of the northern Levant. Little is known about the cults and rituals of the Hurrians, and due to the relatively few Hurrian texts that describe those activities, but some information can be gleaned from the later Hittites. The Hittites adopted many of the Hurrian deities, so it can be safely assumed that they also practiced many Hurrian-inspired religious rituals. The ritual sacrifice of dogs and pigs in a deep pit was one of the more unique aspects of Hittite religion, but excavations at the Hurrian site of Urkesh have revealed that the practice may have begun with the Hurrians. A large circular pit in Urkesh may have served as a place of sacrifice, giving inspiration to the widespread practice in later centuries by the Hittites. The Hurrians had the most profound influence on Mitanni religion, followed by the Indo-Europeans, but evidence suggests that they were also influenced by other neighbours as well. Despite coming from some disparate backgrounds, the peoples of Mesopotamia worshipped many of the same gods and practised many of the same rituals. Many of the earlier Mesopotamian myths and rituals originated with the Sumerians and were then adopted by successive dynasties. The Assyrians were the Mitanni's closest Semitic neighbours, and it appears that they adopted one of their most important deities. Although feminine, Ishtar was a fiery goddess associated with warfare, an ideal fit for the bellicose Assyrians. The Hurrians also revered Ishtar, whom they knew as Shaushkar, going so far as to take her sacred cult statue from the city of Nineveh. 
Now, as will be discussed later, the Mitanni kings considered the Ishtar Shaushgar statue to be one of their most prized possessions, so much so that when they concluded a peace treaty with the Egyptians, it was included as a present. Another important and unique aspect of Mitanni culture was the appropriation and use of land. In most of the major kingdoms of the Late Bronze Age in the Near East, either specific temples or the king technically owned all of the land. Depending on the kingdoms, land could be rented out or even sold, provided that its use was acceptable by the king or temple. The situation in the Mitanni lands was similar, with the king technically owning all of the land, but the king allotted much of the land to the nobles through grants. The land grants could be inherited or could also be sold through a fictive adoption. Nobles who wanted to sell part of their grants would adopt themselves to others who could then inherit part of the land grant by paying their new son, who was often much older than the recipient of the land. The Mitanni kings never seemed to mind the way the nobles gained the system, and it probably helped to stimulate the Mitanni economy. The economy is one of the aspects of Mitanni culture that academics understand in quite some depth. In addition to the fertile lands of the northern Levant, as mentioned earlier, the Mitanni had the benefit of being located in an optimal geographic position. The Mitanni capital of Wasukani was more than likely in a central position, with Mesopotamia to its south, the Levant to the west, and Anatolia just to its north. The trade routes to those regions had almost certainly been established by Hurrians long before Mitanni became a state, and after the Mitanni kings came to power, they were wise enough to allow the trade to continue relatively unhindered. Indeed, the decentralized nature of the Mitanni government system was no doubt quite conducive to the lucrative free trade in the region. The local palaces became the nerve centers of the Mitanni economic system, and censuses were conducted through them in order to calculate taxes and the amount of conscripted or corvée labor needed for public projects. Presumably, after the records were made and the taxes were collected, a fair amount would then be sent to Wasakani and Taidi. The fact that considerable amounts of material wealth passed through the capital cities is known thanks to a number of texts from the era. Some of the Amarna tablets indicate how much wealth Mitanni had and how it flowed from that kingdom to the other kingdoms in the Near East. One letter details all the lavish gifts Tushrata of Mitanni, reigned mid-14th century BCE, sent to Akhenaten of Egypt, reigned 1353 to 1336 BCE, which included some of the following. Four beautiful horses that run swiftly. One a chariot, its tulemus, its thongs, its covering all of gold. It is 320 shekels of gold that have been used on it, the chariot. One dagger, the blade of which is of iron, its guard of gold with designs, its haft of ebony with calf figurines overlaid with gold. One bow of the apisamus type overlaid with gold. It is four shekels of gold that have been used on it. One Maninu necklace, cut from thirty-five genuine lapis lazuli stones. One set for the hand, beads of genuine lapis lazuli, six per string, mounted on gold. Six shekels of gold have been used on it. One garment of blue-purple wool. One pair of shirts, Hurrian style, for the city. One wash basin of silver, one hundred and forty shekels in weight. It is all of these wedding gifts of every sort that Tuzrata, the king of Mitanni, gave to Nimuria, the king of Egypt, his brother and his son-in-law. He gave them at the same time that he gave Taduhiba, his daughter, to Egypt and to Nimuria to be his wife. The luxuries were wedding gifts in a sense, but they were clearly meant to be an ostentatious display by Tuzrata at the same time. These items were also evidence that a lot of trade was conducted between the two powers. Coin currency did not yet exist in the Bronze Age, so trade took place in kind and through bartering, though gold and silver were extremely valuable and served as a pseudo-currency. 
During the New Kingdom, circa 1550 to 1075 BCE, the Egyptians had plenty of access to gold, silver and electrum, thanks to their colonies in Nubia, which they used to import other exotic goods not found in Egypt, including the lapis lazuli, horses and cedar. Mitanni was able to supply Egypt with lapis lazuli, which can only be found in what is today Afghanistan. In one interesting Amarna tablet from Tushrata to Akhenaten, the former complained that he never received two gold statues from the Egyptians and that gold is like dirt in Egypt. The tablet reads, I also asked your father, Nimuria, for statues of solid cast gold, one of myself and the second statue, a statue of Taduhiba, my daughter, and your father said, Don't talk of giving statues just of solid cast gold, I will give you ones made also of lapis lazuli. I will give you too, along with the statues, much additional gold and other goods beyond measure. But my brother has not sent the solid gold statues that your father was going to send. You have sent planted ones of wood. Nor have you sent me the goods that your father was going to send me, but you have reduced them greatly. May my brother now give me the statues of solid gold that I asked your father for, and may he not hold them back. And, with gold being the dirt in my brother's country, why have the statues been a source of such distress to my brother that he has not given them to me? The transportation of the gifts between the kings was overseen by officials from both kingdoms, but apparently merchants from the Levant buffer states also facilitated trade between the two kingdoms. An Amarna tablet, presumably from Tushrata to all of the Canaanites and his sphere of influence, states that they are to allow a particular merchant or messenger named Akia to pass freely to Egypt. To the kings of Canaan, servants of my brother, thus the king. I herewith sent Akia, my messenger, to speed post haste to the king of Egypt, my brother. No one is to hold him up. Provide him with safe entry into Egypt, and hand him over to the fortress commander of Egypt. Let him go on immediately as far as his presence are concerned. He is to owe nothing. Unfortunately, neither of those gold statues have as yet been found, nor have any examples of Mitanni colossal sculptures been discovered for that matter. But there is one style of Hurrian or Mitanni art that became noteworthy. The only true art style that can be identified as Mitanni or Mitanni era is the Nuzi ware pottery. As the name indicates, Nuzi ware is a style of pottery that originated in the Hurrian city of Nuzi and was distributed widely across Mitanni from the Levant to the Zagros Mountains. Nuzi ware pottery beakers were distinct for the geometrical style patterns that decorated the vessels in three registers. The middle register was usually the largest and most decorative. Nuziware beakers have been discovered among the ruins of known Hurrian cities, such as Katna, where they were discovered in the royal tomb. Archaeological excavations have determined that Nuziware and the Mitanni kingdom existed contemporaneously, as there are no samples of Nuziware before the Mitanni, and few samples have been discovered that are dated after the kingdom's collapse. As this suggests, even though Nuzi was not one of Mitanni's capitals, it has become a source of useful information about Hurrian culture and the Mitanni Empire. By translating Hurrian texts from Nuzi, it is possible to uncover a lot of information about the nature of the Mitanni system. The archaeological and textual evidence indicates that Nuzi was a wealthy and powerful city during the height of the Mitanni kingdom. A number of Hurrian and Akkadian texts describe the importance of scribes in maintaining the city's armory. The royal palace of Nuzi, as was the case with palaces in many Bronze Age cultures, acted as the center for cultural and economic life in the city, as well as the residence of the royal prince or governor. And the Nuzi texts also make clear that the palace served as a source of supply for materials used to make weapons and armour, as well as an armoury for complete weapons and armour. Interestingly, the texts differentiate between Nuzi natives and outsiders, although it is stated that the palace supplied Mitanni warriors from outside Nuzi, and in fact supplied multiple Mitanni cities with weapons. Nuzi clearly played a key role in the Mitanni Empire as an important proto-industrial centre. 
The weapons and armor produced in Nuzi were used by the Mitanni kings to lead their armies in the late 1400s against Egypt and the city-states of the Levant. Mitanni power in the region continued to grow during the reign of King Shaushatar, despite the fact that his reign was marked by continued conflicts with the other great powers of the Near East. The Shaushatar ruled Mitanni when Thutmose III was still leading his armies on campaigns, and his successor, Arnulhotep II, reigned circa 1427-1401 BCE, was attempting to do the same. The northern Levant became a buffer zone between the two states, as they traded cities and eventually came to a mutual understanding of the borders. Border disputes with the Hittites also became more common during Shaushatar's rule, or it may just be that due to there being more extant text from his reign it merely appears that way. The textual and archaeological evidence confirms that Shaushatar actively attempted to expand Mitanni's borders and found some success in the east. The king was able to consolidate Mitanni power over most of Assyria, conquering the city of Ashur during his reign. The conquest of Ashur essentially secured Mitanni's eastern border, because to the east of Assyria were the Zagros Mountains. Mitanni's southern border remained porous and somewhat amorphous, and Shaushatar, nor his successors for that matter, did little to change the situation. Since Mitanni's southern border was basically all of northern Mesopotamia, there was little they could do to build any type of buffer state, and conquering Kassite Babylon was out of the question. With that said, Kassite Babylon never gave the Mitanni Empire very many problems. Most of Mitanni's problems came from the north. Beginning with the rule of Tudhaliya I, reigned circa 1430-1410, the Hittites began expanding from their heartland in central Anatolia south into Mitanni territory. The buffer kingdom of Kizuwanda became a battlefield between the Hittites and Mitanni, with the Hittites taking control of the region at some point after 1450 BCE. The Hittites followed up the victory in Kizuwanda by taking the strategically important and materially wealthy city of Ugarit. Despite the loss of two important buffer kingdoms to the Hittites, the Mitanni Empire was still the most influential kingdom in the region. Its expansion into Assyria more than made up for its losses to the Hittites, and Shaushata was determined to not lose any more territory to the other great powers. However, that obstinacy put him and the Mitanni on a direct collision course with Egypt. Two years after Thutmose III recorded a major victory over Mitanni, the two sides met again in Syria, but this did little to settle the situation in the northern Levant and left the Egyptians with a very precarious hold over their possessions in the northern Levant. Logistically speaking, the Egyptians had a difficult time controlling cities such as Kadesh and Dunip in the northern Levant. The Egyptians were able to keep a Byblos under their hegemony relatively easily because it was much easier to bring military forces to that city. Byblos was located on the coast so the Egyptians could send ships if need be. The other cities though were located inland where any Egyptian force would have to march overland through hills, mountains and deserts. It was much easier for Mitanni forces to reach Kadesh and Tunip from their heartland, which the princes of the Levantine kingdoms and city-states understood quite well. The princes thus used the situation to leverage a better deal with Mitanni, so when Shaushata sent Mitanni forces to the northern Levant and Syria to foment rebellion against the Egyptians, it was successful. Although Mitanni was able to successfully win back some of its lands from the Egyptians, fighting them and the Hittites was extremely costly. Chaushata fought one more battle with Arnonhotep II before the two kingdoms decided to deal with each other diplomatically. According to a stela from Karnak, Egypt, Amenhotep II defeated Chaushata on the battlefield. Now, when the prince of Naharin, the prince of Hatti and the prince of Shanha heard of the great victory which I had made, each one vied with his fellow in making offerings, while they said in their hearts to the father of their fathers, in order to beg peace from his majesty, seeking that there be given to them the breath of life, we are under thy sway for thy palace, O son of Re, Amenhotep, the god ruler of Heliopolis, ruler of rulers, raging the lion in this land for ever. 
Like other Egyptian commemorative texts and stelae, this one was full of hyperbole, and it is unclear which side truly won the battle. It's likely the final battle between Shaushatar and Amenhotep II was inconclusive, or even a Mitanni victory, because from that point forward, the Egyptians begin treating Mitanni as an ally. From Shaushatar's perspective, he had to make a decision on which enemy he would turn into a friend, Hatti or Egypt. With the Hittites being the more immediate threat, making an alliance with the Egyptians was practical and logical. The Karnak text is also important because it is Egypt's first recorded entry into the Great Powers Club of the Near East. The three major kingdoms, Shanha was Babylon, recognized Egypt, which in turn began a long relationship stroke alliance between Egypt and Mitanni. Atatama I, ruled circa early 1300s BCE, came to the throne during a period that was filled with instability and political uncertainty. Paratana II may have come to power after Shaushata very briefly, but little is known about this potential king, and once Atatama I did ascend to the Mitanni throne, he continued his predecessor's policy by maintaining the alliance with Egypt. The Egyptian pharaoh at the time was Thutmose IV, reigned circa 1401 to 1397, who was known more for his diplomacy than his martial abilities. The diplomatic ties between the two kingdoms were sealed with a marriage. In one Amarna letter, Mitanni king Tushrata, ruled mid-1300s BCE, recalls how his grandfather Atatama sent a Mitanni princess to Egypt to wed Thutmose IV. When the father of Nimuraya wrote to Atatama, my grandfather, he asked for the daughter of my grandfather, the sister of my father. He wrote five, six times, but he did not give her. When he wrote my grandfather seven times, then only under such pressure did he give her. Not only did Atatama ensure permanent peace between Mitanni and Egypt where he gave his daughter to Thutmose IV, he also established a regular practice whereby the Mitanni king sent some of their princesses to Egypt. The Amarna letters that detail these marriages highlight some interesting aspects of Near Eastern geopolitics and some peculiarities of Mitanni and Egyptian culture. The Mitanni kings had no problem sending their women to Egypt, presumably never to be seen again. The Mitanni women were well cared for in Egypt as part of the royal harem, and they enjoyed all the privileges and amenities afforded to Egyptian nobility. In return, as has already been noted, the Mitanni kings were given generous amounts of gold and silver. Both sides were apparently happy with the arrangement, and although the Mitanni king sometimes asked for more gold in the letters, the Egyptian kings were always pleased with their new Mitanni princesses. Interestingly, the Egyptian kings never offered any of their princesses to the Mitanni kings. In fact, there is not a single case where an Egyptian king offered an Egyptian princess to any of the other great powers. Still, the arrangement was quite lucrative for the Mitanni kings, so it continued through the reigns of Shatana II, ruled early 14th century, Artashumara, ruled circa mid-1300s BCE, and Tushrata. Shatarana II's rule coincided with the reign of one of Egypt's longest-living pharaohs, Amenhotep III, ruled circa 1388-1349. During Amenhotep III's rule, Egypt experienced an era of unprecedented material prosperity, and the Egyptian people were able to enjoy the spoils of the empire thanks to the past conquests of Thutmose III. Amenhotep III was engaged in relatively few military campaigns, as Egypt's northern boundary was secure through its enduring peace with Mitanni. The era of prosperity that Egypt enjoyed was also enjoyed in Mitanni, with gold and silver flowing from Egypt through its cities and Mitanni princesses in turn being sent to Egypt. An Egyptian hieroglyphic inscription on a scarab briefly describes how Shutarana II sent his daughter, Kergipa, to join Amenhotep III's harem. Year 10, under the majesty of the son of Re, Amenhotep III, ruler of Thebes, who was granted life, and the great king's wife T, who liveth, the name of whose father was Ewa, the name of whose mother was Fuya. Marvels brought to his majesty, life, prosperity, and health, 
Kogipa, the daughter of the chief of Naharin, Saturna, and the chief of Aharin ladies, 317 persons. By the mid-14th century, Mitanni was in the midst of its period of greatest wealth and influence in the region, and about to have its most famous king, Tushrata, come to the throne. But before he did, the Mitanni state almost collapsed internally. After Shuturana II's quiet but effective reign, the Mitanni royal house was temporarily thrust into turmoil when a civil war among the Mitanni elites broke out after two branches of the royal family vied for power. Shuturana II's successor was Arta Shumara, the brother of Tushrata, but little is known about Arta Shumara's rule because he was assassinated in relatively short order by supporters of Tushrata. The level of Tushrata's complicity in the murder of Arta Shumara will probably never be known, but it appears that he at least turned a blind eye to the conspiracy. The assassination brought back a considerable amount of stability to the Mitanni Empire, allowing Tushrata to consolidate his domestic political alliances and to legitimize his rule to his people and the outside world. The primary source evidence shows, though, that Amenhotep III was not happy with the Machiavellian machinations in Mitanni, so, to put the Egyptian king's mind at ease, Tushrata had Asashumara's killer executed or at least a man who he claimed was the assassin. With the ugliness of Arta Shumara's assassination behind him, Tushrata was able to focus on continuing his relations with Amenhotep III and his successor, Akhenaten, ruled circa 1353-1336 BCE. The power dynamics of the Great Powers Club consisted of preserving the status quo, so minor powers were only rarely elevated to the status of a great power, and for the most part the great powers would cooperate to keep it from happening. The Canaanite city of Amuru was growing in power during Tushrata's reign, threatening some of the city-states and kingdoms that were under either Egyptian or Mitanni hegemony. Amuru was located in an area that stretched from the Orontes Valley in Syria to the Mediterranean coast, it was technically under Egyptian rule, but there was no local prince or governor who administered Amuru. In fact, Amuru was somewhat of a lawless region that acted as a buffer between Egypt and Mitanni. When a local potentate named Abdi Ashurta began claiming to be the prince of Amuru and threatening the Egyptian possession of Byblos, it threatened the stability of the region. According to a letter, the situation became so unstable that Toshrata visited the region personally and then requested Egyptian aid in the form of Nubian mercenaries, Meluha, to support Ribhada of Byblos. The text reads, The king of Mitanni visited the land of Amuru itself, and he said, How great is this land! Your land is extensive. May the king of Egypt send me his commissioner that he may take it for him. Moreover, come yourself with all speed and take everything, then return to get the archers later on. Moreover, get, and get too, two hundred men of Maluha. Abdi Ashurta is very ill, who knows when he dies. Abdi Ashurta was killed under suspicious circumstances after this event, so it is likely that either the Egyptians, Mitanni, or both somehow orchestrated his assassination, hoping that his son and successor, Aziru, would be more pliable. Aziru, though, proved to be just as rebellious as his father, needing a major attack on Byblos that resulted in Rib Hadda's death. Despite the somewhat unstable situation in the northern Levant in the mid-14th century BCE, Tushrata was able to ingratiate himself even further with Amenhotep III and then Akhenaten. Thirteen of the Amarna letters are correspondence between Tushrata and Amenhotep III, Akhenaten, and Amenhotep's chief queen and Akhenaten's mother, Tiye. One letter details how Tushrata sent a cult statue of the goddess Shaushka of Nineveh to Amenhotep III as a gift, just as Shuturana II had done during his reign. Thus, Tushrata, the king of Mitanni, who loves you, your father-in-law. For me, all goes well. For you, may all go well. For our wives, for your sons, for your magnates, for your chariots, for your horses, for your troops, for your country, and for whatever else belongs to you, may all go very, very well. Thus, Shalska of Nineveh, mistress of all lands, I wish to go to Egypt, a country that I love, and then return. 
Now I here with Sender, and she is on her way. Now in the time too of my father went to this country, and just as earlier she dwelt there, and they honoured her, may her brother now honour her ten times more than before. May my brother honour her, then at his pleasure let her go, so that she may come back. To Shrata's decision to send the statue may seem like a minor event, but given the importance of cult statues in the ancient Near East, it was actually momentous. Cult statues in general were very important because they were believed to embody the earthly avatar of the particular deity. As such, they rarely left their temple, and having one taken in a war was considered a most ominous sign. On the other hand, to give one to another people, as Tushrata did, was a way of spreading the deity's influence. Shaushka was the Hurrian version of Ishtar of Nineveh, which is where her cult statue was housed before being sent to Egypt. The gift of the Shaushka statue opened a way for a new alliance to be concluded between Egypt and Mitanni. Indeed, Tushrata and Amenhotep III seemed to enjoy being pen pals, as many of the Mitanni Egyptian Amarna letters were between those two leaders. The two kings enjoyed trading gifts, and reading the texts of the tablets might lead readers to think that part of the arrangement involved the leaders trying to one-up each other in terms of wealth and ostentatiousness. Of course, Tushrata had no problem sending more Mitanni princesses to live in Egypt, as another tablet indicated. Say to Nibuarea, the king of Egypt, my brother. Thus, Tushrata, the king of Mitanni, your brother. For me, all goes well. For you, may all go well. For Keluhima, may all go well. For your household, for your wives, for your sons, for your magnates, for your warriors, for your horses, for your chariots, and in your country, may all go very well. Since you are friendly with my father, I have accordingly written and told you so my brother might hear of these things and rejoice. My father loved you, and you in turn loved my father. In keeping with this love, my father gave you my sister, and who else stood with my father as you did? I herewith send you one chariot, two horses, one male attendant, one female attendant, from the booty from the land of Hatti. As the greeting gift of my brother, I send you five chariots, five teams of horses. And as the greeting gift of Keluhiba, my sister, I send her one set of gold toggle pins, one set of gold earrings, one gold mashu ring, and a scent container that is full of sweet oil. There is no evidence that the kings ever personally met, and it is likely all the transactions were carried out by various emissaries and high-ranking nobles. Beside the laundry list of luxurious items delisted in the letters between the Mitanni and Egyptian kings, the letters reveal a bit about the Mitanni idea of history. Although there are no extant copies of true historiographical texts from Mitanni as there are from Egypt and Mesopotamia, some of the Amarna letters, especially the ones written by Tushrata, reflect on the reigns of kings earlier in the Mitanni dynasty. They certainly indicate that the Mitanni kings had an idea of the past and historiography, even if the idea was not well developed in writing. After Amenhotep III died, it marked the beginning of the end of the long period of relative peace and stability in the Near East. When Akhenaten replaced Amenhotep III, he immediately set about to change Egypt, and today he is most famous for implementing an aggressive religious change that made the Aten the sole god worshipped. There are signs that Akhenaten met some domestic resistance to his new theology, but he continued his father's foreign policy of friendship with Tushrata and Mitanni seemingly without issue. According to a letter from Tushrata to Akhenaten, the former officially congratulated the new Egyptian king by sending yet another Mitanni princess as a gift. Say to Nimureya, the king of Egypt, my brother, my son-in-law, whom I love and who loves me, thus Tushrata, the king of Mitanni, your father-in-law, who loves you, your brother. For me, all goes well. For you, may all go well. For your household, for your wives, for your sons, for your magnates, for your chariots, for your horses, for your warriors, for your country and whatever else belongs to you, may all go very, very well. In view of friendly relations, Mane, my brother's messenger, came to take my brother's wife to become the mistress of Egypt. I read and re-read the tablet that he brought to me, and I listened to its words. 
Very pleasing indeed were the words of my brother. I rejoiced on that day as if I had seen my brother in person. I made that day and night a festive occasion. Within six months I will send Kelia, my messenger, and Mane, my brother's messenger. I will deliver my brother's wife, and they will bring her to my brother. May Shaushka, my mistress, the mistress of all lands and of my brother, and Aman, the god of my brother, make her the image of my brother's desire. Although Akhenaten has been portrayed as having no interest in foreign affairs, since they were essentially unnecessary to his religious reforms, all archaeological and primary source evidence indicates he was willing to maintain the status quo in the Levant with Mitanni and the Hittites. However, despite reaffirming Egypt's alliance with Mitanni, Akhenaten was powerless to protect Tushrata or stop the general decline of his ally to the east. Tushrata's time on the Mitanni throne ended just as it had begun, with plenty of chaos and violence. Historians are unsure of how Tushrata was assassinated, but nearly all agree that he was murdered by forces within the Mitanni royal family. One theory is that the faction of nobles who were initially opposed to Tushrata resisted him the whole time, and eventually gained the support of the Hittites. Sometime toward the end of Tushrata's reign, a rival claimant to the throne named Artatama II may have controlled a region of northwest Mitanni. As the rival faction within Mitanni fought Tushrata and his forces, Tushrata may have been murdered by one of his sons. Another theory holds that Tushrata's assassin was his nephew and future Mitanni king, Shatana III, ruled circa mid-1300s. Neither Atatama II nor Shatana III ruled very long, as they found it nearly impossible to consolidate their power from within Mitanni and simultaneously fight back the Hittites and Assyrians. The situation for the Mitanni Empire became critical after 1340 BCE. Atatama II initially had success re-establishing the dynasty and stemming the tide of Hittite and Assyrian aggression, but the Hittites kept bringing pressure from the north and the west, while the Assyrians marched closer to the Hurrian homeland from the south and the east. The Hittites and Assyrians were both difficult problems to handle at any time on their own, but since they began their expansions at nearly the same time, and their campaigns coincided with the internal feuds in Mitanni, the Mitanni kings could do little to stop them. Although Egypt was their ally, and they had by then had a long tradition of friendship, Egypt in the post-Aknaten period was experiencing its own internal problems and was unable or unwilling to help Mitanni. The Mitanni kings not only had to deal with the numbers of their enemies, but also the supreme capabilities of one of their enemies in particular, Supiluriuma I of Hatti. The Hittite king wisely used the internal struggles of the Mitanni royalty to his advantage, while at the same time leading his army south of the Taurus River against a Mitanni vassal state named Nukashi. Tushrata was still the Mitanni king at the time, and although he lost Nukhashi to the Hittites, he was able to prevent their further advances into Mitanni territory. Tushrata would not have long to enjoy his proclaimed victory though, as Superluliuma regathered his forces for an even larger, more sustained campaign into Mitanni territory. Superluliuma assembled his force in Hatti and marched across the Taurus River south into Mitanni territory. The campaign began in the border region of Ishua, before moving farther into the Hurrian heartland and Wasukani. The war was commemorated on a later text known as the Shatawaza Treaty. It read, I, the son Supiluriumas, the great king, the king of the Hatti land, the valiant, the favorite of the storm god, went to war. Because of the king Tusrata's presumptuousness, I crossed the Euphrates and invaded the country of Isua. The country of Asua I vanquished for the second time, and made them again my subjects. I proceeded to the provincial city Suta, and ransacked it. I reached Wasukani. The inhabitants of the provincial center Suta, together with their possessions and together with their deportees, I brought to the Hatti land. Tusrata the king had departed, he did not come to meet me in battle. I took prisoner Suta Tara together with his son, his Marianu, his brothers and with all that they owned, and brought them to the Hatti land. 
Because of King Tusratus' presumptuousness, I raided all these countries in a single year and conquered them for the Hatti land. On this side I made Mount Niblani, on the other side the Euphrates, my frontier. Interestingly, Tushrata apparently attempted the same strategy Paratana employed years earlier against the Egyptians by retreating to the Mitanni interior, but it was unsuccessful against the Hittites. Since Mitanni was much closer to Hatti than it was to Egypt, with some planning the Hittites were able to overcome the logistical problems of a long-distance military campaign. Tushrata met his fate at his own people's hands some time after the Hittite destruction of Washukani, and this marked the beginning of the end for the Mitanni Empire. As mentioned previously, Artatama II won back some land Mitanni lost to the Hittites, but his victory was brief and unable to be followed up by Shutana III. What was left of the state of Mitanni effectively became a Hittite vassal by the rule of its last king, Shatiwaza, Kirtiwaza. The most important document from Shatiwaza's reign is the eponymous treaty he signed with Subiluliuma, which made clear he was a subordinate to the Hittite king and that Mitanni was no longer a great kingdom. If you, Kirtiwaza the prince, and you, the sons of the Hari country, do not fulfill the words of this treaty, may the gods, the lords of the oath, blot you out. You, Kirtiwaza, and you, the Hari men, together with your country, your wives, and all that you have. May they draw you like malt from its hole. Just as one does not obtain a plant from Mubiwahi, even so may you, Kurtiwaza, with a second wife that you may take, and you, the hurry men, with your wives, your sons, and your country, have no seed. These gods of the contracting parties may bring misery and poverty over you. May they overturn your throne, yours of Kurtiwaza. The Hittite language text was clearly written from the perspective of the superior Sopiluliuma to his inferior Shatiwaza. Sopiluliuma never related what would happen to him if Sopiluliuma decided to break the oath because oaths in the ancient Near East were meant for the inferior party to be followed. Interestingly, the text does offer a slight ray of hope to Shatiwaza that if he follows the rules, the greatness of Mitanni may return. If, on the other hand, you, Kurtiwaza, the prince, and you, the Hurrians, fulfill this treaty and this oath, may these gods protect you, Kurtiwaza, together with your wife, the daughter of the Hatti land, her children and her children's children, and also you, the Hurrians, together with your wives, your children and your children's children, and together with your country. May the Mitanni country return to the place which it occupied before, may it thrive and expand. As it turned out, the Assyrians would make sure that Shatiwaza was never able to restore Mitanni to its glory years. In fact, the Hurrians experienced repeated setbacks and widespread devastation to their land at the hands of the Assyrians. Between the 14th and 11th centuries BCE, the Assyrians were able to expand their borders from a city-state based around Ashur, and in the process the Middle Assyrian Empire became a major regional power in the Near East, not to mention a military juggernaut. The Assyrians also developed a sophisticated corpus of written material during this period and became exceptional diplomats. Since Middle Assyrian society became dominated by the military, it had something similar to the feudal structure that dominated Europe in the Middle Ages. Although the expansion of the Assyrian state during the Middle Assyrian period was fairly gradual, the rule of Ashur Ubalit I, circa 1365 to 1330, is generally viewed as the beginning of the period, and also when the expansion began. Ashur Ubalit I was able to take advantage of troubles outside the Assyrian kingdom by annexing territories to Assyria's east out of a Hittite's attacked Mitanni, and by the rule of the Assyrian king Tukulti Ninurta I, circa 1243 to 1207, the Assyrians had consumed the Mitanni kingdom east of the Euphrates River and were well on the way to wiping out that entire kingdom. The Assyrians may have been upstarts in the geopolitical system of the late Bronze Age Near East, but they learned quickly and impressed their peers. 
The Assyrian king Ashur Ubalit, ruled circa 1363 to 1328, began cutting chunks of the eastern Mitanni Empire away, starting with locations in the Assyrian heartland such as Nineveh and Ashur. An unknown Egyptian king, possibly A, ruled late 14th century, had no problem forgetting about the Egyptian Mitanni alliance and welcoming Ashur Ubalit into the Great Powers Club. Say to the king of Egypt, Thus Ashur Ubalit, the king of Assyria, For you, your household, for your country, for your chariots and your troops may all go well. I send my messenger to you to visit you and to visit your country. Up to now my predecessors have not written. Today I write you. Once the Assyrians were accepted into the Great Powers Club, though, they apparently had the same perceived problem as the Mitanni, not receiving enough gold from the Egyptians. Ashur Uwilit even complained in a letter that he was the equal of Mitanni, Hani Galat, and thus should receive as much gold. Is such a present that of a great king? Gold in your country is dirt, one simply gathers it up. Why are you so sparing of it? I am engaged in building a new palace. Send me as much gold as is needed for its adornment. When Ashur Nadinahi, my ancestor, wrote to Egypt, twenty talents of gold were sent to him. When the king of Hani Galbat wrote to your father in Egypt, he sent two talents of gold to him. Now I am the equal of the king of Hani Galbat. But you sent me a quantity of gold, and it is not enough for the pay of my messengers on the journey to and back. Ashur Uberis' campaigns may have made him the equal of the kings of Mitanni, but his activities ensure that his successors would be their superiors. Assyrian king Adad Nirari ruled circa 1305 to 1275, all but finished off Mitanni during his long rule. And as was common with all Assyrian rulers at the end of the Bronze Age, Adad Nirari chronicled all of his major military campaigns. He mentioned several Mitanni cities by name, Washukani or Ushukani, and refers to the Mitanni or Hurrians generally as Suberians. Part of the chronicle reads. Adanirari, illustrious prince, honoured of God, lord, viceroy of the gods, city founder, destroyer of the mighty hosts of Kassites, Kuti, Nulumi, and Shubari, who destroys all foes north and south, who tramples down their lands from Lumdu and Rapiku to Eluat, who conquers Taidi, Shuri, Kahat, Amasaki, Hura, Shuduhi, Nabula, Ushukani, and Iridi, the whole Kashieri, region, as far as Eluhat, the fortress of Sudi, the fortress of Haran, as far as Carchemish, which is on the bank of the Euphrates, great-grandson of Ashur Ubalit, the mighty king, whose priesthood in the great temple was glorious, the peace of whose reign was established to distant lands firm as a mountain, who destroyed the armies of the wide-spreading Shubari, who enlarged boundary and frontier. The Assyrians had pretty much conquered the eastern part of Mitanni at that point, but they still faced Hurrian resistance in what was once the western region of Mitanni. In response, Adad Nirari I ended the Mitanni state and seriously threatened the survival of the Hurrian people. By the early 13th century, the conflict shifted from the surviving Mitanni to the Hittites and Assyrians battling for dominance, with most of the remaining city-states and principalities that had a notable Hurrian or Mitanni cultural background being part of Hatti. The surviving Hurrians no doubt felt a bit closer to the Hittites, as they worshipped many of the same gods and also had a fair share of familiarity. The Assyrians, though, were not content with controlling their little slice of northern Mesopotamia. They continued to make forays into former Mitanni territory in Syria and the northern Levant. One of the last Assyrian mentions of Mitanni, or Hani Galbat, was made during the reign of Shalmaneser I, ruled 1272 to 1244. When, at the behest of the great gods, I advanced against the land of Hani Galbat, with the mighty hosts of my lord Ashur, I forced my way over difficult roads and narrow passes. Chaturara, king of Hani, the army of Hittites and Alani, Arameans, with him, I surrounded. I killed countless numbers of his defeated and wide-spreading hosts. Against the king himself at the point of the spear, unto the setting of the sun I waged battle. I cut down their hordes, 14,400 of them I overthrew and took as living captives, 
Nine of his strongholds, his capital city, I captured. One hundred and eighty of his cities I overturned to tells and ruins. The army of the Hittites and Alami, Aramaeans, his allies, I slaughtered like sheep. At that time, from the city of Taidi to the city of Iridi, the whole Kashiari mountain region, to the city of Aluhat, the stronghold of Sudi, the stronghold of Haran as far as Karkamishk, which is on the bank of the Euphrates, I captured their cities. Their lands I brought under my sway, and the rest of their cities I burned with fire. The Shaturara mentioned was a puppet Mitanni prince who ruled at the pleasure of the Hittites. He may have had the same name as earlier Mitanni kings, but he was far from their greatness or power. By the middle of the 13th century, Mitanni had been reduced to just another Hurrian principality that needed Hittite protection from the Assyrians. The late 2nd century BC was a period of unrest in the Near East, especially as the Bronze Age was swept away and replaced by the Iron Age. The transition to the Iron Age proved to be especially violent, and it brought about the end of the Great Powers Club. A mysterious coalition of warrior tribes known collectively as the Sea Peoples ravaged the coastal kingdoms of the eastern Mediterranean, and they destroyed the kingdoms of Ugarit and Hatti, and nearly destroyed Egypt as well. Since they were located further inland from the Mediterranean coast, the Assyrians did not suffer as much from the Sea People's attacks, but the empire was not totally immune to the general situation either. A group of Semitic-speaking people, known as the Arameans, began to attack and ravage numerous Mesopotamian cities around this same time. The Aramean raids became the primary focus of Tiglath-Pileser's reign, a fact mentioned in the historical annals. With the help of Ashur, my lord, I led forth my chariots and warriors and went into the desert. Into the midst of the Alani, Arameans, enemies of Ashur, my lord, I marched. In the country from Suhi to the city of Karkamish in the land of Hatti I raided in one day. I slew their troops, their spoil, their goods and their possessions in countless numbers I carried away. And the rest of their forces, which had fled from before the terrible weapons of Ashur, my lord, and had crossed over the Euphrates, in pursuit of them I crossed the Euphrates in vessels made of skins. Six of their cities, which lay at the foot of the mountain of Beshri, I captured, I burned with fire, I laid them waste, I destroyed them. Their spoil, their goods, and their possessions I carried away to my city Ashur. Despite Tiglath-Pileser's best efforts, the Aramean hordes eventually reduced the Assyrian Empire to its original heartland around Ashur by 1050 BCE. It will probably never be definitively determined how and why the Assyrians survived the collapse of the Bronze Age in the first place, but it was likely due to their military prowess. When the Assyrians crawled out of Ashur after the interregnum imposed on the region by the Arameans and Sea Peoples, they quickly established themselves as the most powerful people in the Near East. There are numerous extant primary sources from this period, not only because the Assyrians became meticulous compilers of their annals, but also because other peoples, most notably the Israelites, also wrote about the Assyrians. Beautiful and detailed pictorial reliefs have also been excavated from the royal palaces in Ashur, Nineveh and Kala that depict numerous battlefield tactics and weapons in great detail. Ironically, the fact that the Assyrians kept such detailed records helped consign the Mitanni, who did not, to the dustbin of history.